Walking with Jesus through the Gospels, and tonight we are at the cross. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, and we're going to look at verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Parallel with this is in Mark chapter 15. What did we say here? 30, 35. That was 35. 35. 27, 35. Mark is 15 and verse 22. Oh, I looked too high, sorry. 24. And John 19. So Luke didn't have it? Looking at 23. Luke didn't have that part. Luke with the garments. He doesn't have. All right, so in looking at this, this is a fulfillment of Scripture. Anybody know where we find it? Uh, it's in the Psalms. <laughs> yes, yes. Psalm 22? Yes, another good guess, Psalm 22. It's a very messianic psalm, so I was thinking. Yeah, 22. <laughs> psalm 22 in verse 18. Uh, would you like to do that one as well, please? They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Psalm 22 is the most descriptive passage in the Old Testament regarding the cross. Isaiah 53 is a close second. But as far as content and descriptiveness from the Old Testament, Psalm 22 as it hands down. So we see that this isn't just a description that David is coming up with that's a generalized or generic about himself. It's prophetic because David was a prophet. Where do we get that from? How do we know he was a prophet? Because uh, we know he was a king, right? He was a king, yeah. Um, so how do we conclude or come to the point that he was a prophet? One of the, I think Paul or something mentioned it. One of the, I don't, I don't know which one. So one of those guys in the New Testament mentioned in one of the books they wrote. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Peter wrote it, or Peter spoke it, Luke wrote it, uh, Luke, uh, Acts chapter 2. And he writes, or he speaks about the fact, David being a prophet spoke these things. And that would be in... Um, Boy, Acts 2 and verse 33, maybe? 30. So he says, David being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath, and then he continues on speaking about Christ. As in reference to how David had referred to him, and he's quoting different passages that David had written. So we know David was a prophet because Scripture tells us that he was a prophet. So he's prophesying the death and resurrection of Jesus. So Psalm 22 is the most messianic psalm, or messianic psalm and messianic chapter in the Old Testament. There's various aspects of what's going on in this passage. We can take Matthew 27, verses 32 down to, to 44, and there's so much going on there in Psalm 22. But 
I'm going to refrain from dealing with Psalm 22 just yet. We're going to bump that ahead just a little bit. We're going to take it from uh, another passage when he's when Jesus uh, just a further bit down in Matthew 27 when Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Now we looked at that <clears throat> several weeks ago in response to a question that had come up or a statement I think that had been made. And in that uh, context, I responded to that from Psalm 22 and mentioned that we were gonna deal with that in greater detail uh, the following week. And we didn't, not because I had forgotten, but because I intended, once I just, just, uh, looked at it a bit more, I thought we need to delay that until we actually deal with it when we get to the point when Jesus makes this declaration. So because there's other elements that deal with Psalm 22 in this small passage in Psalm, uh, Matthew 27, we are going to wait and sort of lump that together when we get to that declaration, that statement that Jesus makes. In the meantime, let's have a look at Mark 15, 24, and 25. And when they crucified him, they divided his heart casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him, and the description of his accusation was written about the king of the Jews. So we had seen in Matthew's account how they were um, dividing his garments. So this is keeping us in the same context, right? So we're seeing that this is the parallel aspect. Mark tells us when this is taking place. So what's the time frame? It was nine in the morning. Where did you get that from? Verse 25. So does it say in your translation? Yes, it, was nine it says in it the was morning? nine in the morning. Okay, so the NIV, is that yes. what you have? So yes. the NIV translates it as nine in the morning. In the Greek, you would actually say at the sixth hour. Third hour. Excuse me, what did I say? <laughs> he said the sixth, <laughs> the third. See? At the third hour. <laughs> The third hour, all right? So that was in mind because the third hour from what? Based on what? From 6 a.m., all right, sunrise. So from the, the third hour is calculated based on when daybreak begins in a sense, all right? Which makes it as is translated directly. So they bypass what it actually is, the, the literal translation to the transliteration, meaning so that we understand it directly without having to look at what the original was. So at nine in the morning, what does that tell you that this was nine in the morning? So all that's going on here, remember, uh, he is he's crucified and looking at back in verse uh, 21 and 22, they brought him to the place called Golgotha and Verse 23, 24, we're seeing that they're offering him wine mixed with myrrh. That's another aspect of Psalm 22. And then they crucified him. Now he's on the cross. They're dividing his garments. And Mark tells us that all of this is taking place. His crucifixion is occurring at 9 a.m. Why 9 a.m.? Is that crucifixion hour? Is that what was scheduled for, for crucifixions? Must have been? Time of the morning sacrifice. So when Pilate says, go ahead and crucify him, hands him over to, hands Jesus over to the religious leaders, to the chief priests and the elders, he doesn't do so to say, okay, now make sure he's on that cross by, by 9 a.m. He's not doing that. But who's in charge here? God's in charge, right? Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, where... In silent night, says Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. It's not just Lord at thy birth, but also Jesus, Lord, at thy death, right? So he's, his birth was overseen. It wasn't happen, happenstantial. It wasn't coincidence because with God, nothing is 
coincidental. So just as much as his birth was planned in every respect, every detail, right down to the minutest bit of information, so was his death. Nothing was left to, well, I hope this goes right. Long as, you know, um, you know, we, let's sync our watches and make sure the battery, well, the, it's all wound up. <laughs> Not saying 10 after 7. You're Not saying, saying 10 after 7. <laughs> Not saying it's seven o'clock when it's actually ten after seven, <laughs> like happens for those that are joining us. So we see that God is orchestrating everything, even down to the time that He's being crucified. And the morning sacrifice is called a Haggai. Haggai chapter one. Jesus is nailed to the cross at the time of the Haggigah. Sacrifice, morning sacrifice. Haggigah. Or offering. So is the evening offering the same? question yes we'll ask her tomorrow <laughs> so Jesus is being offered at the time of the morning sacrifice so he's crucified then and he's going to die at what time anyone know three in the afternoon which is what time I'm what was referred to as the evening sacrifice. As a matter of fact, the, the Passover sacrifice offering that would be done on that day would be offered at three in the afternoon at the very time that Jesus was giving up his spirit. Nothing left to coincidence. Nothing whatsoever. All right, so let's go to Luke chapter 23. We're going to bring in verses 32 to 34. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminal, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know, know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. So we see all of this is taking place at the very same time, all right? And we're seeing that the very first thing that Jesus says on the cross is, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. There's nothing else recorded about Jesus. Uh, from the moment that he leaves Pilate, is there? So the last thing that Jesus is re having is recorded as having said then is in chapter nineteen, uh, uh, excuse me, chapter eighteen of John. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to my voice. He doesn't make any utterance. He doesn't make any complaints or rebuttal. Uh, I said that was the last thing, but he says, there's one other thing, sorry. Uh, the last thing he says in chapter 19, when Pilate says, you have, uh, do you not realize I have the power of life and death? I could, I could kill you or let you go free. With respect to the, the women of Jerusalem, this, the, this is the last thing he says in the judgment setting. Okay. So the last thing he says then is, you would have no authority, no power over me unless it had been given from above. So he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. 
So this is the last thing that Jesus states in, in reference to those who have the role of authority or the power, so to speak, to, to crucify him. The last thing that he uttered between that time and now that he's on the cross is as has been mentioned, was when he speaks to the women of Jerusalem and said, don't weep over me. We dealt with that last week. We're not gonna get into, go back into that again to review that tonight. So now here's the first statement that he makes. How many things does Jesus say when he's on the cross? How many statements? Okay, seven statements on the cross. Is that right? Yes. Usually a, a safe number when you ask a number of, of things in the Bible. Seven is usually a, a good first choice. <laughs> Followed up by three, and then if that doesn't work, try ten. All right, so here is Jesus on the cross, and he makes this statement. Why does he say this? He's on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so he's on the cross for forgiveness of sins. So a reasonable thing to say the first time, or the first thing that he says when he's on the cross. He's on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. There's still a softness in it. Yeah. So when you look at the, we see that two criminals were crucified alongside of him, either side. And when we come to look at them, we'll discover that they're both blaspheming. They're just, uh, they're shaking their fists, and it's metaphorically speaking, because they're crucified, right? Can't shake their fists in God's face. But symbolically, that's what they're doing. They're blaspheming God. Jesus, we say that is, he's still soft, meaning that he's not become embittered or enraged. He's not out to revile and I'll get you. But he's, he's, he's the very epitome of love. His love come down. So why does he say this? Who is he saying it to? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. He's talking to God. Who's he speaking about? Father, forgive whom? Priests, the people, everybody. us, everybody. Okay. Let's dig into that a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's, that's in the context of the scripture. He was right on. Mm -hmm. The people that are at his feet, the ones that are doing the crucifying, the ones that are so we've got that are put him who are at his who who's around the cross right now. We we've just his, read about his it. disciples. Well, let's look at just what we've read so far. We've just the read soldiers. the soldiers are there, and what have they done? Clothes. Before that. You're right, but before they that. Yeah, they're the ones <laughs> that took up the spikes and with the hammer. All right, so Father, forgive them. And they are there dividing his clothes. And uh, then beyond them, you have, they're not, we haven't mentioned them yet, but we the also have. Says, and the people stood by watching, and the ruler scoffed. A gen general crowd, and we're going to discover that uh, the there. his mother is there. Some of the, Some of the disciples are there. Yeah. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Let's look at some passages of what Jesus speaks earlier in his ministry to get a context, a glimpse of what Jesus is speaking here and why he's speaking this. Why these seven statements that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks and not others? Are these statements simply in response to what he's experiencing in the moment? And so it seems appropriate then to 
speak to that? Well, you know, some of them are from scripture. So okay, like yeah. Previous scripture, so you probably probably where it gets it from. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's his word. <laughs> so. Yeah. He only speaks what the Father tells him to. He says in John. All right, so let's have a look at some of these things. Let's go to John chapter 5 and verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So this is very early on in Jesus' ministry. This was not just something that he speaks about that he was doing at that point, doing those things that he sees the Father doing, but it was during his entire life while on earth. The only things he did was what he saw the Father doing. Now let's fast forward to just several weeks ago in walking with Jesus time. Okay, to John chapter 12. And let's look at verses 49 and 50. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. What does Jesus speak? Only that which he has received from the Father. So he doesn't just go about and as a, as a matter of response to circumstances, situations, and then just, here we go. Notice... He's very measured in what he does say when he's standing before the Sanhedrin during that trial. And he's very, or a couple of trials, very measured in what he says or does not say before Pilate and before Herod. So he's not just speaking things because questions are asked of him or because he could have said so many things, couldn't he have? Oh, yeah. I mean, he could have said so many things. But he doesn't. He says surprisingly very little, which in itself says very much. So that he's speaking only a few things while on the cross, we need to recognize that these are very intentional statements. Not just, oh, look, Father, forgive them. That he takes notice of them. So let's dig in a little bit more. As we let's go to Isaiah 53 and verse 12. I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered by the transgressors. A uh, bit more. Oh, okay. Please. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. No problem. No, no need to be sorry. It's interesting of what Jesus is doing here and how scriptures speak of him in what he is securing through his crucifixion in contrast to what's taking place just at his feet. When you have the Roman soldiers, what are they doing with his garments? Dividing them, aren't they? Look what Isaiah 53, 12 tells us about dividing Who's going to be dividing what? Revelation. 
right there in the very first sentence. I'm going to divide. This is the Lord now the speaking, of, speaking of Jesus. So the Father speaking of Jesus. I will divide him a portion with the many. What is that? Dividing the spoil with the strong. We are co heirs with Christ, so we get what Christ gets in proportion. Yeah, do you remember last week when we looked at the this inscription was placed over Jesus' head, and we've already read that just moments ago, right? And when we looked at Colossians chapter 2, do you remember what that was saying regarding an inscription that was placed upon the cross of Christ, nailing it to the cross? That we are nailed to the cross, yeah. crucified with Christ. Okay, so um, that's true. So that's coming over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. But in Colossians chapter 2, it speaks of the handwriting of ordinances or that which we were guilty or convicted of charged against us was nailed to the cross. So you were right that we are, but in the context of what we're looking at of Colossians, that the charge against us was nailed to the cross and through that he took it out of the way. In other words, he, received, he took our guilt and our punishment and died in our place. And then it says, having disarmed powers and principalities, what did he do? He was spectacle of them by triumphing over them in the cross. Right, so the Lord Jesus triumphed, triumphed over these powers and principalities and made a spectacle of them through the victory of the cross. And as a result, great spoils were secured, the spoils of war were secured for Jesus, and he now divides it among us, the strong. Now, we're not strong in ourselves. He doesn't say, okay, all right, all you, all you strong ones, come and we'll divide it. No, he says, those who are weak and weary and burdened and heavy laden, you come to me and I'm gonna give you rest. I'll give you my strength. What's that verse that says, he took captivity captive and gave gifts Ephesians chapter four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we see at the very end of this, as he's numbered with the transgressors, so there we have the two criminals on either side, yes. numbered with the transgressors, as though he himself is one as well. And he yet, he bore the sins of many. So distinction is made even to the point where Peter tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his own body or by himself bore our sins in his own body. Yet there were two criminals on either side, but they had nothing to do with the price that was paid. When we come to see the criminals, we'll see why were there two criminals crucified with Jesus? Why did God set it up that way instead of just Jesus there alone? Why wasn't Jesus just there himself as a centerpiece without these distractions, so to speak? Think about that. And we're going to address that if we get that far tonight. Skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> and he made intercession for the many, for the transgressors. The intercession, what is the intercession that Jesus made? Just the, what you said there, brother. Father, forgive them. Or okay. you're, just, you're just referring to this here. Yeah, so yes, and let's, let me uh, rephrase the question to make it a little more clear. Um, what does it mean that Jesus intercede? Inter what was his intercession? What does it mean that he interceded for transgressors? So what do we often think of when we think of intercession? Go between God and man. Going between, go between, between God and man. So he's, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy. Either 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> <laughs> I can't recall right off. Uh, but oftentimes we think of intercession as 
this. We need, to, you know, we need to intercede in prayer. That's not what Jesus was doing here. His intercession was his crucifixion. Even as the high priest went into the most holy place on behalf of the nation of Israel, he interceded on their behalf. So by his act of offering the sacrifice was his intercession. Jesus, by offering him his life, was the intercession. You have it there, huh? You're looking, are you looking for? I was, but I didn't see it in chapter two. Didn't see it in chapter two? It might be in chapter one then. God gave covenants. Chapter, chapter 2, sorry, verse 5. 1 chapter, Timothy 2, five. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Yes. All right. Thank you. So one mediator, mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, and verse 5. So that's what intercession means. It's a mediator, one who goes between. So God had made several covenants throughout history with his people. He made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham, with Moses, with David, etc. What was the covenant that God made with Adam? Look after the garden? Mm-hmm. I know it's not part of it. The dominion over. Oh, yeah, dominion over earth. He gave it all to him. He gave it all to him. So, what did God give to, to Adam? He gave him all the creation. He gave him everything. So, everything let's look. Except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Pardon me? Everything except the tree of knowledge. Everything except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, with that, Adam enjoyed. Remember, as Adam is, is put in the Garden of Eden, the Lord said uh, he put him there to work it and to keep it. And those are words in all used uh, in when those words are put together. The only other time they appear in the Pentateuch, the, the five books of Moses. It's in this context. It's in the context of the Levites serving at the tabernacle. The only time that those words together are used, they're used in reference to the Levites at the tabernacle. They, they kept it and they, they served and they kept it. They were you know, an act of obedience and, and worship is what that's referring to. So that gives us indication that the Garden of Eden wasn't just a beautiful place to live, to build a family, have children, find a job. <laughs> this, this was the place that with that kind of a wording is indicating to us that this was the very temple of God. Eden was the temple of God and Adam was the priest thereof. They met with God. They met with God. In the cool of the day, right? So this was a matter then where God was giving him his presence He enjoyed the presence of God because he is his priest. It's perfect interaction. Unhindered interaction with God, right? He's also received, the Lord says, go and uh, eat of all of the trees of the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's an abundance. There's no limit of what he can enjoy and receive. So God has given him his provision. And does he have to do it on his own? No. Now this is not, you're right, but we're not talking now that he gives him ult, uh, eventually woman, a wife. So yes, he gives Eve, but more than he gives Eve, he gives himself. He gives, the Lord gives with his presence and his provision, he gives him his power. His ability to do what he needs to do. So his presence, Provision and his power. What is he? 
What does the Lord require from Adam? Obedience. Obedience. So the obedience he requires then, we're going to put it this way. So the obedience is do this and you will live essentially. The day you eat of this, you will surely die. That speaks of obedience, right? Obedience. So he requires from him perfect personal obedience. One command. One command. How did he make up? One command. And he couldn't keep it. Well, he kept it for a while. We don't know how long. He kept it for a while, <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Got him. It's true, but he had the power of God to keep it. Yeah. So he had the power of God to keep it. Until he decided he didn't need the power of God, power of God or his presence. presence. And as a result, he lost all of, that. all of that. All right, so, what was that? But. <laughs> but. But Jesus. Yes, but Jesus. Adam was told to keep away from the tree. And his disobedience brought about death. Jesus was sent to go to the tree. His obedience through his death brought about life. It's interesting, the connection to the tree, right? Now, we're not saying Jesus died on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No. <laughs> it just means that he died on the tree. Right, but we have a, a theme here of the, of the tree, the eights, Hebrew eights, the tree. So in Jesus, will we turn to John 8 and verse 29, please? Uh, no. I don't intend at this point to come back to Genesis. I'll put it that way. So John 8 and verse 29. Pardon me? I think maybe I was just in Genesis. Was that what you were I was just making reference to Genesis. I went there too. <laughs> That's all right. That's good. Because we, we need to go to where the scripture is, is being discussed, right? Yes. John 8 and verse 29. John 8 29. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do what Jesus him, even as he spoke many such days to him. What does Jesus say here? That he always does what? He always, he always pleases always his father. I always do what pleases his father. Always, always. Always means? Always. Always, <laughs> always means? Always. Never is there an, a never. It's always, always. I always do what pleases my Father. That speaks of perfect personal, personal obedience. Jesus came, according to Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6, as the covenant for the nations. It says the Gentiles, all right? Covenant for the Gentiles. But the word there is goyim, which means the nations. So Jesus coming as the covenant for the nations. What is it that God required of Jesus when he came? What he required of the first step? Perfect personal obedience for himself? No. For us, for the nations. And what did, what did God then in a sense, make agreement that he would give his son through his life. He would give him his presence, his vision, and, and his power. 
So the last atom has the same setup as the first atom in order to redeem what the first atom lost. So when Jesus comes to the cross now, even that is a, an act of perfect personal obedience because I have come. For this very reason have I come. This was the reason I came. We see elsewhere that Jesus says that um, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many through the cross. So now that Jesus has successfully had perfect personal obedience, what is our role in response to what Jesus has done? It is to believe. And in believing is the receiving of what he has secured for us, which is this. He's restored to us and for us the presence, provision, and power of God through the cross and the resurrection. Now, here's coming back to this. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. It's not in the context so much of they don't know what they are doing, present tense, but it's they don't know what they do as though it's like this. Here's Jesus. He's on the cross. Here's the corridors of time. And here's Mr. Adam and Mrs. Eve. The first command, perfect personal obedience. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Serve me here. I'll give you my presence, provision, and my power. He disobeyed. So what's Jesus doing when he utters, makes this declaration? It's like a shout. All the way back. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. If, if Adam and Eve had realized the extent of what they had done before they had done it, would they have done it? Hopefully not. <laughs> Exactly. So we can't say no, they wouldn't, because they they were operating in their own strength at that point, right? So at some point or another, it was the likelihood of them continuing on in in the strength that they, God gave. It's a it's a, it's a hypothetical. But they didn't realize all that was going to take place. Yeah, we knew what the Lord said, that we would surely die, but what does that mean? So it doesn't mean that they, pardon me? They didn't know anything. They, they didn't know anything. They just they knew know. it wasn't good. They knew it was disobedience. Something unpleasant, undesirable. But when Jesus speaks, it's they don't know what they do. So his act on the cross, it's not just something that goes in this direction to you and me today because that's the mindset that we have. Jesus did an act. When you and I do something today, it affects from that point forward. It doesn't affect anything in the back. We can't reach into the history, into our past and correct things, can we? We can only do things now that might alter the course that we take or, or the outcome of things that might otherwise take place. But Jesus, being God, this was an act that reached, that impacted the cosmos, and reached back in time, so to speak. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. 
and I'm setting the record straight because his act on the cross didn't only take care of everything future, but it took everything, took care of everything past as well. For all those who put their trust and faith in God, found their redemption in the cross of Jesus Christ. So that we can get back to a garden of Eden. So, so that, that we can get back and have that to the garden of Eden. Yes. Fulfillment of Genesis 3, too, right? I mean, this is where mm -hmm. going back into that. Yeah. Very point in time. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So that he's taking care of all the sin from Adam onwards. Because his sin was not uh, covered because of the, the animal, the lamb that was sacrificed by God himself in Genesis chapter 3. That was a foreshadowing, a symbol of what would take place here. And as they received and walked in that by faith, it was like an it was like the Lord was saying, uh, I'm gonna write you and I owe you. And it was paid in full here. You remember that Abraham believed God and God credited that to him as Righteousness. So we've got Abraham, we'll call him Abe. And now he's drawing credit. Anybody draw credit today? Nowadays? I mean, credit card, mortgage, car, pay, car loan. He gave him credit. What was his credit? Righteousness. Righteousness. Who had to pay for the righteousness? Jesus. Jesus. It's not something that Abe, Abraham, was. Uh, we'll put the short form here. I'm going to refer to him as Abraham. Let's not see it. Yeah, we'll be thinking Lincoln. <laughs> right, yeah. This is even greater, better than the imagination. Right? This is the ultimate imagination proclamation. Yeah, that's right. So he was given the credit of righteousness that was paid in full by Jesus. So Jesus made forgiveness a part of the covenant. So original sin, Jesus is saying, Father, now you can forgive them. The them is the ones who put sin into motion. And Jesus then, it's like a domino effect from that point on. Let's come back to Let's go to Luke chapter 23 and verse 40. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, let's do 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This man had a change of mind because Matthew chapter 27 and verse 44 and Mark 15 and verse 32 tells us that this man was giving himself to the same thing as the other criminal where they were both blaspheming and they were both mocking Jesus. Let's look at them. Um, I think we're just going to look at the Mark one, 15 and 32, if I'm not mistaken. Did I write down the right? Yes. Yeah. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the 
cross, that we, <coughs> sorry, that we may see and believe, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. It's amazing that these guys who, who are crucified with him just decide, let's, let's get in on this. And they're reviling Jesus as well. So in the midst of this reviling of Jesus, something happens with one of them. What changed his mind? I think you have an example there of um, he's seeing things on the cross. I mean, what Jesus is saying and doing there mm -hmm. is and being watched. Yeah. Not just by the criminals. Mm -hmm. There's there's soldiers. There's people who walked away from that and beat their chest mm -hmm. after seeing what they were, because they were all into it down there. And, <laughs> and, and his own followers were standing at the back watching them do this. Mm -hmm. and, and so they walk away from this when they see how Jesus died and how he handled himself on the cross. And they knew that they had made a grave error. Mm -hmm. at that point. But this man, um, the, the thief on the cross, he starts to see things a little differently. But I think something deeper is happening here. The same sort of thing you're getting when um, Jesus asks Peter, who do you say I, who, uh, that I, who I am? Mm -hmm. And he says, you are Christ. He says, God bless you. Simon, son of Jonah, but God has me. And God is moving. This is the thing. When someone is on their deathbed, God can reach in. Because mm -hmm. God is the, the king of hearts. Yes, he is. And, and that's what he's doing here. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so God is working on this man. Is he working on the other guy too? Probably, yes. Yeah. Because he's always working. But not everyone is responding. And so the Spirit of God is at work in this man, and he's, he's becoming responsive then. And as our, has been mentioned, Craig, um, he's seeing and hearing things, and he's not hearing some other things. Remember that Jesus chose his words very carefully. Only that which he heard his Father speaking is what he, speak, is what he is speaking. Only what he sees his Father doing is what he is doing. And so... Jesus isn't cursing. He's not complaining. He's not spitting on the people that are, are around him, the, the ones that are dividing his garments. And that's being observed. And what he does say up until this point, what's the only thing that he's that this criminal now has heard Jesus say? He's probably thinking, he, if, as he's reviling and he hears this, is he like, is he doing a double take? He's like, who does that? Who does this? And because this, this declaration, Father, forgive them, is coming right back, Father, now you can forgive them, also brought it right forward to his present day and right through to our present day. And now he's realizing the depth of his sin and forgiveness is being offered and provided, paid in full. So he recognizes this to be the case. And as he sees these things going on, he hears these words being proclaimed, he's convicted. And as he's convicted, he responds in faith. And so, as a result of this, when he turns to Jesus, he's first of all, he begins rebuking the other criminal. Here he was doing the very same thing. And then he says, don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserve. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. There's another declaration, a recognition of his innocence and free from guilt. His recognition of Jesus' innocence. It's also his recognition of Jesus as king. Yeah. He, he, he makes... Because he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. kingdom. And his king means that he recognizes him as the, what's the word? Messiah. The Christ. 
That's what king is, the anointed. And then Jesus, second statement. What does he tell him? What's the first word? Amen. Truly, verse 43, truly or verily, depends on your translation. And it means literally, amen. It means faithful or true. It comes from Isaiah chapter 65 where God's, one, one of his names is being referred to here as the amen. And Jesus here says, amen, truly, because he is the truth or of a truth, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. What an, what an amazing declaration because for him to say this, what has he just told him? I am restoring this. Today you will be with God. Presence. Jesus is making provision because of the power of the cross. The power of the resurrection. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So when he says paradise, what's another word for paradise? Paradise. Gone, garden of Eden. Eden is referred to as a paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. What is Jesus doing on the cross in this declaration? He's restoring paradise. He's restoring what was lost. Because you remember when Adam and Eve sinned, the last thing we read in Genesis chapter 3 where, where they disobey God and God pronounced curse and judgment upon them and he provides the sacrifice and the covering of the, of the uh, skins, uh, clothing of skins, then he does what with Adam and Eve? Gives them out of the garden, puts an angel in front of it. Not just an angel, oh, but cher cherubim. Cher 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 so cherubim is plural, cherub is one, okay? And so they're, they're exiled from paradise. What does that mean, cherub is a guardian? Guarding not to prevent access, but to receive access. Because when we see the cherubim, the first time we see cherubim mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. The next time we see cherubim mentioned is in Exodus chapter 25. In what context? On the ark, the mercy seat. And the mercy seat represents God's presence and its fulfillment. That The fulfillment of the mercy seat's symbolism is found in Jesus, who we're told in uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, that God made him, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation there is the word that literally means mercy seat. It's the same word in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5 where it says, speaking of the items of the tabernacle and the mercy seat, these things we don't have time to speak of in detail, is, is Hebrews chapter 9. But the word mercy seat, the only other time in the Greek in the New Testament that we see that word mercy seat is in Romans 3 and verse 25, propitiation or atonement. The same word and it's referring to Jesus who is our mercy seat, the presence of God. And he's the one who has provided access, restored access into paradise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. paradise of God. It speaks of the presence of God. It speaks of the mercy of God in what's taking place here. So with the cherubim at the, at the entrance of the Garden of Eden, the entrance to, to um, paradise, what was there with these cherubim? There was a sword. What kind of a sword? Flaming sword. Flaming sword. And it speaks of, the sports sword itself speaks of truth, and the flame speaks of judgment. A flaming sword. 
a sword of judgment moving in every direction. Because this the sword of God, the sword of the Spirit, it searches the thoughts and the intents of the heart, lays bare who and what we are. Nothing is hidden from his sight. And so the, the sword judges rightly. It judges in truth. And so if someone tries to come to the garden, it's like, no, you're disqualified because you've been judged and you have been found lacking, wanting. So there's this flaming sword and the word of God now on the cross is fulfilled. And what Jesus has done, forgiveness has provided reconciliation. Father, forgive them. And now it's being enacted. It's being demonstrated at, at that moment, showing what, what has taken place that can only be seen in the, in the spiritual realm, so to speak, is now being demonstrated to this man. In real time, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, it's an exchange from hostility with God to divine favor. By changing us, by changing this man, this man couldn't do anything. He didn't have time to, uh, to tithe. He didn't have time to go to church. He didn't have time to get baptized. He repented. He had nothing else. So he believed. He repented and he believed. And with the believing, he received. There was an exchange made. There was an exchange of his sin for the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Because now, Jesus isn't only dying for his sin, his own, or excuse me, that's, he's not just dying for this man's sin, he's dying for the sins of the entire world. But we see that, that it's like, Okay, here's the, the, the first real-time demonstration of what I'm doing, and it's like what, what was written above this man's cross, it's as though the Lord came down and literally removed that inscription and put it upon the cross of Jesus. Why were there two criminals there? To demonstrate what mankind is like. We are all blasphemers. We are all revilers of God. But God is at work in our hearts and the Holy Spirit woos us. He convicts us to draw us to the Lord and to open our eyes and to rescue us. And if we're willing to humble ourselves, because that's what this man had to do, right? I mean, there was, he was shamed just as, just as greatly as Jesus was. He was naked on that cross, a lot of shame, a lot of scorn for this man. But he's full of pride. And then he humbles himself. I've, I've made a mess of my life. I've got nothing to offer. There's nothing to live for, and I can't live any longer because here I am, and I have no hope to die for but now. Isn't it amazing that they even bothered to mock Christ when they were like, they're bleeding too and they have stripes on their back and they've got nails through their hands. And, and so as humans only, they're suffering this intense pain, but yet they took the time to mock him. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a godless decision. What Adam did in the garden was a godless decision. He disobeyed. And that curse came right down through anybody who makes a godless decision. They, they're deciding to take a different path than the one for God. Mm -hmm. and, and it gets them in all kinds of uh, all kinds of trouble. And even at the point of death where the very hope of life eternal is right there in front of you. And he still decides to go his godless way. Yeah, you know, it's 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 uh, godlessness doesn't necessarily mean great wickedness. It means you have no plan for God in your life. That's right. It's like at the end of time when Jesus is ruling for a thousand years, but yet there's still there'll, there'll be many a... many scripture says multitudes that will. Rebel. rebel against him after he has been literal king 
ruling this entire world for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So here because we see he doesn't these... like what they do. I guess they don't like they don't like what he does. So we see these two criminals who are sinners, and they represent us. We're blasphemers. Then we see the forgiveness of God. Then we discover that judgment against us has been removed. That flaming sword, Jesus took the, our judgment. And we're being uh, dissected, if you will, by truth. The sword of the spirit, it cuts, it divides to the very, uh, between soul and spirit and bone and marrow. We're being, we're being penetrated by truth and judgment has been set aside and righteousness has been made ours. I, yeah, I can only imagine what welled up inside of him <laughs> when Jesus said those words. We will be with you. So this, this man went from death to life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what is the paradise of God? Paul speaks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4. He says, I know a man who went up into the third heaven, whether in, in the body or out, I do not know. But he, it is this type of a man that I will boast about, I will speak about. He says, and he was caught up into the paradise of God. So the third heaven is the, is the paradise of God. It means the presence of God is Paradise. Twice he, he refers to the third heaven as the paradise of God. Verse 2 and verse 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And then where's the last place that we see spoken of as the paradise of God? The book of Revelation. Revelation. And that's in chapter uh, 2 and verse 7. So here we, let's look at one last passage. We're going to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, incidentally, the, the uh, Revelation passage, it says, uh, those who hear these words of mine, that they will um, he who has an ear to hear. He who has an ear to hear. Go ahead and read it. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Adam and Eve were kicked out of paradise, no longer permitted to eat of the tree of life. And now those who have ears to hear, who are conquerors, overcomers, that he'll give the right to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Paradise restored. So Ephesians chapter 2, the last thing we'll look at tonight is verse 6. Um, just 6? Maybe not. That's I guess that's the crux of what we want to see, but let's have a look at, pardon me? Let's look four to six, yeah. Four to seven. And we are at? Um, Craig, I think. Craig? Okay. Okay. Uh, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So having spoken about what our former existence was like when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, now we see the greatness of the, the love and mercy of God. Incredible. The hymn writer penned this line. 
Nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. I think it would be a fitting place to finish our time at the uh, foot of the cross for tonight, and we will look at the third statement that Jesus makes and the fourth next time we're together.